Afternoon, everybody. Um, this is our usual annual ARM and AOT64 boff. Um, I'm not going to do most of the talking, I hope. I hope, well, actually, I hope most of you are. Um, but before we start, we have a few updates that we've happened in the compiler over the, uh, the last year or so. Um, Wibco, I think you're first. All right, so I have a quick update on the Atomics work. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work on Lipatomic recently. Um, so one of the big things that happened recently is the 128-bit uh, Atomics are now all fully uh, lock-free. So that means they're much faster and you don't have to any problems with uh, needing to use locks. That's all in GCC 14. Uh, so far, no complaints, so everyone seems to be happy. Um, also, in terms of architecture support, we have added LSE, LSE 2, LSE 128-bit support in GCC 14, and, and LRCPC 3 uh, support in GCC 15, which is already uh, committed. Another big thing we've been working on is an actual Atomics ABI. Um, this was um, a shared work with a, a graduate student um, who has been helping out with uh, proving the Atomics and uh, um, you know, handling the theoretical aspects of uh, Atomics, how they work, and uh, how to model them. Um, at the moment, the, the current document is in alpha state, and it lists all of the uh, current sequences that we support um, that are correct and have actually have been tested. In terms of future work, um, where we found an interesting issue in the atomic uh, struct types that have been added in C and C++, I think in C11 or something, quite a long time ago, but the um, ABI in both GCC and LVM, they differ quite dramatically. Uh, LLVM uh, will always inline the atomics and they're lock free, while GCC uh, always uses lipatomic using uh, locked sequences. So those ABIs just don't work together. So my goal is to, to try to align those ABIs uh, and also make sure that uh, the sequence is always lock free. Um, that means that you can get an interesting invariant where all sequences up to about 16 bytes, so the maximum uh, supported atomic size for a particular ISA, are always going to be lock free. And you don't then have lip calls uh, to lip atomic or any other atomics library. Because in general, the embedded people and Linux kernel people, they don't like uh, these kinds of library calls. There's another thing uh, we want to try improving uh, outline atomics. Um, there was some discussion uh, last year on it. Um, not much has happened since then, but hopefully we can continue that discussion and uh, improve those. Uh, similarly, uh, people have been asking to inline 128 bit atomics rather than calling lip atomic as we do right now. Um, so that's the atomics part. Are there any questions on this? Um, well, basically, um, AI64 defines uh, sequences that work in all cases for 128 bit atomics. So, uh, so, how do you do, sorry. so, how do you do that? Say you have uh, a type of 13 byte. How can you ever make that atomic? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. How, how do you make it work? The architecture yeah. defines sequences that work. But how? Uh, it's 13 bytes. How can you ever store 13 bytes in an atomic way? Uh, you round it up to 16. That's what LLVM does, and it works. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so this only works if the data uh, in memory next to, next to your atomic does not have any atomic entities. Okay. Yeah, you need to increase the alignment of the of the right. access. That's already true. If you have uh, today a um, an exact uh, power of two, um, and you say you know char eight, then it gets eight byte alignment. It's it forced eight byte alignment, sure. so that the hardware atomic can be used. Okay. So for seven, why not do the same thing? Just update the alignment. But it is effectively a slight ABI change because of, you see, different alignments. And you, and you could do that, an ABI change for it? Sorry, do you? Uh, you could do an ABI change for this. Well, you could, yes, of course. It's just uh, a change. Well, you, probably, probably <laughs> you can do anything. I mean, effectively, yeah. the, the 120 atomic changes we've done are effectively also minor ABI changes. 
if you really want to find those changes, you can probably find ways of making it fail. But in reality, it just works. So. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Yes. Um, one thing from a programmer's perspective when using the GC Atomics is that it, there's no good way to tell I don't want libatomic in the source code. So, like, uh, there are some cases where you are operating on a shared memory mapping, for instance, where you know that libatomic emulation will actually break stuff for you. And from a programmer perspective, it would be nice to have an API to express that at the source level, maybe with an extra flag in the, uh, what's it called, the memory order argument. So that the compiler basically refuses to compile if it doesn't uh, do what the programmer expects. And right now that doesn't seem to be happening. I agree, that would be nice that um, C++ didn't define it all this way and you just have to sort it out somehow. Because you can actually create a four kilobyte atomic structure yeah, and it's all allowed, and it somehow needs to do. And the interesting thing, Lip Atomic uh, can actually deadlock quite easily if you do this kind of thing. So don't do it. <laughs> which which, which, which is in a, it would be better, indeed, if you could just get an error if you use something that needed locking atomics. Yeah, it's a bit complicated because there are different ways of emulation. So sometimes emulation in Lip Atomic is fine if it uses a syscall, and the syscall relies on the kernel to do the right thing internally. Yeah. So then we probably want to do it. Uh, it's still acceptable to, to the programmer. And yeah, I don't have the correct of con set of conditions in my head. It requires more research, I think. And that's probably the reason why it hasn't been done. If I'm, yeah. Okay. So, but it would be, I think it would help with uh, changes like that in, instead of uh, yeah, conditionally supported atomic type sizes to make that more robust from a programmer perspective. Okay. Thank you. Um, another um, thing we've been working on is uh, vector math support. Um, so we've been um, adding uh, support for lib and vec in uh, glibc 2.38. That first had only a few functions and then later versions had more and more functions. Um, we're still currently working on further performance optimizations on that. Um, every now and again, we're getting another five to ten percent on, you know, XPen lock and these things. Um, in total, we've got now uh, 108 uh, different uh, SIMD and SVE implementations. These are unique implementations of float, double, um, and all of the different math functions. Uh, overall, it gives about one percent uh, on SpecFP, as uh, the graph shows. Um, this is playing just, just neon so far. Um, SVE is not yet enabled, so it's supported, but it's not yet enabled uh, in GCC. There is still some um, issue with uh, masking support. Once that is enabled, uh, hopefully in GCC 15, um, then hopefully the, these numbers will even improve further. Um, there's still an, a really old problem with SIN calls F. Um, as people probably know, they, they use pointers, which is just a really bad interface design. Um, on modern cores, that effectively means you need to store to memory and then immediately load back, and you get all kinds of stalls as a result. Uh, so one uh, option is to try getting a better interface and uh, avoid all these stalls, and then you will get much faster code. Last that one. Any questions? Um, do you know why there are performance degradations for some of the tests? Um, Performance varies. These are very small. I'm, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but it's like less than half a percent, probably not 0.1, not 0.2%. Sometimes you, you can actually get slight slowdowns with factorization in general, right? Because your code's layout changes. Sometimes it uses a factor function um, and it may be slower. It can happen. But on average, it's, it's faster, which is the goal. <laughs> Sorry, and one other thing what, where can I find ARM's GCC 14 blog? Oh, the blog. Uh, it's it. The, the link is live, in the, but I'm not sure we can. <laughs> when the slides are down, yeah, the, 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 you can search for the blog. If you, I think, if you say GCC 14 blog, you get a huge four-page HTML uh, blog. Uh, everything's in there.
Um, and, and another interesting thing I found recently, um, when you use the early scheduler, um, then it actually turns out quite slow. Um, I don't know whether this is an AS64 only issue. Um, I think it, it's, it looked to me, if I looked briefly at the profile of it, and it seemed like very generic allocates and deallocations. Um, but about 50%, um, if you switch the early scheduler off, uh, you get about 50 cent compile time speed up. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether you used 02 or 03 or 05, it's all pretty much the same. Um, and the other interesting thing as a result is um, the performance gain that it gives um, on AS64 is actually pretty small. So one of my ideas is to switch it off and um, figure out where the issues come from if there's any, any slowdowns. So, the only sort of main difference I've seen is in uh, complex factorized loops where it looks like the scheduler makes some difference um, when the register pressure is really high. And this is a very old problem as well. Uh, when the factorizer emits its code, it seems to uh, emit it in a particular order that is not necessarily the best for um, you know, reducing register pressure. Um, there's an interesting thing here um, in the register allocator itself. There is another combined pass, which is probably relatively unknown. It's, combined, it's, it's called combine and move instance, and it seems to be just sort of doing a very last minute uh, merging of uh, immediates uh, into, into moves and other instructions. It then doesn't give that instruction another chance to split if there's a split defined for that instruction. Um, and then as a result, it, it's not generating optimal code. I even found some bugs in, in patterns as a result. Um, so um, in principle, we could turn that off as well as a, if it doesn't really diff, give that much benefit. And in order to solve the, the, the scheduler issue, um, I'm wondering whether we could perhaps do something about um, a live range reduction pass after the vectorizer to solve this ordering problem. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you, I guess. Uh, so for, to, the, to the last point, uh, I think uh, me and Andrew Pinsky wrote in some bug last week about kind of that issue. So one issue with, with doing any kind of scheduling at the Gimpel level is that there is the great thing called TER, Temporary Expression Replacement, at RTLX function, which basically undoes everything so that means that instructions in Gimple inside a basic block have no order apart from their data dependence. TR actually operates on, it's, it's, I think it's blocked on calls, and so it, it kind of subdivides the basic block a little bit further. But yeah, so, so it's, it's, not, it's not trivial. If you turn it off, you get regressions. I tried, I think, two or three times. Um, so yeah. So in, in, in the in the bug I, I was mentioning, Andrew says that we are uh, not doing like code motion, so code syncing in particular, when we sync to a post domination block because it's just called movement. And 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 I was saying, well, yeah, and also because of life range issues there, uh, that it would be useful. So maybe we do want a cross basic block or cross TER block scheduling of statements because those uh, that scheduling at least would prevail TER. Uh, it, it, I think it's one of some of Click's work from many years ago. They have a an uh, what you could think of as a statement scheduler that might be useful here. Um, if you, and so what, what I would look at is throwing away all the redundancy analysis that does and just use the scheduler part of that. Um, the other thing to look at, um, Bernd Schmidt did something in, I, I think he was doing it after TER. Do you remember? Yeah, it was, I, I, that, might be, that might also be worth looking at, but he was trying to address pathological problems for allocation. He wasn't really looking at this set of problems. But there might be something useful there. Maybe. Yeah, so I, I, I do agree that we want to kind of try to address the regis, register pressure issue somehow. But, but of course, usually it's, it's not easy to solve by just scheduling. That's just the very easy cases. Usually well, it's Yeah, all this happens difficult. so early, we don't really know what our, our 
we don't know what a good target is this early in the pipeline. So do you, do you know if, if the ARM backend, who obviously enables the early scheduling, does it enable the shed pressure model or does it use... Yeah, I think, I think it is on because I think I copied it not too long ago. I think, I think okay. we even turn off the shed model in some cases because it just makes things so much worse. Well, yeah, x86 does it as well because it, it breaks allocation. I don't think it's quite that bad. I mean, it does make things... We, we turned it on again a couple of years ago because it made things so much better, actually. So. It's one of these swings and roundabouts. This year it's better, next year it's worse. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, part of the problem is that it, um, it can move things too much and therefore create too many life values. And, uh, uh, like the uh, like, like the terror problem where you have lots of artificial dependencies, that's always wrong. Yeah, always I mean, I, I think these days on modern, fully out of, or nearly fully out of order cores, um, there's very little to be gained from precise scheduling. The main thing that we want to do is keep the yeah, in order depends. parts of the core uh, fully active which means yeah. not issuing multiple loads in a single cycle a, because we a, can only feed two of them into, a, a in, into, the, execute, or into the issue units. We, a, we want a, to keep a good mix of instructions, and that's far more important. A big, than, ben, a big uh, benefit of scheduling is uh, uh, like with swing wrapping. Uh, you can move, move stuff around. So uh, just, just because you move it around, it's no longer a problem. It's no longer a hindrance for other instructions. Yeah. But, and I mean, out-of-order cores now are so good at, you know, firing off hundreds of instructions and executing them when they're sure. ready. We don't have to worry about the precise ordering of the instructions. Right. What we need to do is keep the in-order parts of the core busy so that they are keeping the execution units fully fed. Sure. But it, it almost sounds like you're saying that the kind of precise scheduling that we thought was so important in the 90s and the 2000s is becoming less and less important. And I would say irrelevant. from what I'm looking yeah. at, that tr holds as well. Yes, almost irrelevant. Um, the, the only bit of the core that's really in order these days is, is the bit that takes the instructions, breaks them up, does the dependency analysis, and feeds them into the issue queues. And after that, everything just executes as the data becomes available. Yeah, the, the, the only wrinkle I would... Yeah, I mean, some some architectures got there before before ARM. Some will get there after ARM. It's yeah, right. It's, and and Segar just hit what I was about to say is we. Yeah. I know of some architectures where that's not true yet, or is partially yeah. true. Well, ARM, ARM still but does that's it just on life. the cores, and on those the the precise ordering does does have some effect. But the uh, the majority of the high end cores now are so out of order in their back end oh, God, yeah. uh, that you know that they can hold instructions up for hundreds of cycles. Well. Yeah, hundreds. Probably, yes, hundreds you're, you're, you're of not cycles, off this. <laughs> but uh, it, it all depends. I mean, ultimately, you're going to get stalled because you're dependent on this thing that's out on waiting on external memory. And yep. that is going to take thousands of cycles, and there's nothing you can do about those. No, there so really isn't. Think about it. The front end and the back end are a thousand cycles apart already. Yeah. Just, just for instruction decoding, branch prediction, that kind of stuff. We should move on because yeah. we've got a lot more to go through. Okay. Pisha from Czech Technical University. Uh, but for small cores, it is still very important to schedule probably the instructions in the right order. Uh, yes, yeah. For, for, the, for, small, the, small, for the small in order cores, scheduling still matters. Yeah. Um, but for out of order cores, the only thing that really matters is keeping the decode units busy. That's just another reason to buy or in order for, right? Yeah. People still like them, and they, they certainly have power benefits. Strange people. <laughs> Some people still have to work, operate in a tethered environment. Oh, sorry, an untethered environment. Where are we next? Yeah, so first I have to say I've done none of this work, but the people that did aren't here, so I'm going to speak on their behalf. But in uh, GC14, I think it was Andrew that mostly worked on this, um, added support for ARC4 function multiversion, obviously something that uh, x86 already did. 
uh, and I'm just going to expand a bit on what happened there. Uh, well, I can see the slides here, can't I? Yes. Um, there are some limitations, so we're missing a couple of um, features, but there are also the biggest one is that target versions not work in C++ only, or sorry, only works in C++, doesn't work in C. Uh, we also, uh, again, not me, but someone else within ARM uh, wrote, uh, learning paths is a little tutorial on how to use function multiversioning, explaining both how to use LVM and GCC, also explaining the caveats for GCC 14. This is an example I stole from there. It's just simple, like a function with a loop, and we say, well, create me a clone for SV and default, and this basically generates these I shortened the code, there's more to it, but these little, these two different um, compilations for the same loop, the left one default using uh, advanced SIMD and the right one using SVE and then there's a runtime dispatch thing that works very much like iFunks, checks, oh, what features are there available? Can I use SVE, use SVE, can I not use SVE, use the advanced SIMD one. Um, there is feature work plan for GC15, which is the main one is support target version in C. Uh, we've got some people in the team working on that. And uh, obviously also syncing the supported features list with the specs and therefore also achieving uh, parity with LVM. And I think more important for the people here in the room is that we are looking at also refactoring some of the FM or functional multiversioning uh, codes to deduplicate the code across GC because we've seen that different backends do almost the same thing with different pieces of code. Uh, uh, one of them is for resolver building and the other one is for name mangling. I think there's one even with name mangling that we have to go and undo some of the mangling that was done because it doesn't quite work out for us. So I think they, uh, the, the, the team would like to work on some bits of code to basically refactor this and create target hooks and all sorts of things so that it all becomes a bit neater. Uh, I think that's it for functional multiversioning. Tamar. Question. Oh, question, sorry. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Uh, so, I mean, in the example you showed, it seems superficially that the SV code seemed uh, better than the Neon code. I was wondering if you think the infrastructure could be used to do some of this automatic multi-version vectorizer. So, if you compile for like a generic target, but if something GC decides, oh, well, actually, the SV could do a much better job than Neon, can I just generate the runtime check for SV and then emit I mean, the Neon and SV ones? That idea sounds cool. The problem with that is, where do you do it? If you do it everywhere, you're gonna end up with a pretty fat binary, right? Which is the whole reason why we want these things. But yeah. Yeah, so there's also the implementation issue that at least in GCC, we currently can't switch the ISA in the same function. So you would need to yeah. basically offload the, each of the loops you want to handle that way into a separate function and do it a like function call overhead. Outline the, the loop and yeah. That's a good point. Uh, I, I tried the function multi visual, but it uh, seems not to work with the, the optimization FLTO. If I use FLTO, it will be broken when you use a tribute target. Uh, how can we restore this problem? I, I, I have to admit. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit I haven't tried with FLTO yet, but that's good. Yeah, please do file a bug yeah, report. File bug reports for things like I'll that. We'll have a look at because it. Because then, then we don't lose track of them. I noticed SV in your example, but are you extending it to all the minor features in SV and all of that? The, there's a list uh, on an ABI so document that so is the public. the is there, okay. There is, it's not all, but there's a list there of the ones, and it shows also the priority between them. Um, Perfect, thanks. All right, uh, so in GC 14, we added the support in the loop factorizer for early breaks. Uh, the way it was implemented is that it's pretty much applicable for any factor target that has support for factor comparisons. Uh, you just have to implement the C branch, which is the conditional branch instruction. Um, in GC 14, it has a number of limitations. Uh, for one, it can only work for known sizes or for when the factorizer can determine that the access can never cross a page boundary. Uh, we have work ongoing to 
relax that in GC15 by doing alignment peeling or mutual alignment checks and stuff like that. Uh, that patch is almost done, just fixing up some, some profiling issues, and then we should be able to send it upstream. However, this method of factorizing is not really the most efficient way for, G for SVE, uh, because for fully master loops, you don't really need a, um, to branch to the scalar code. You can do the reduction in vector code already. And so, but in order for you to do that, um, you need first faulting loads. So I don't know if people are aware, but first faulting loads are a mechanism in which you accumulate faults over all the loads you've done in a particular region. Uh, so if you have three loads, for instance, at the end you'll get a predicate that tells you the number of elements that are safe to access for that iteration of the loop. And so that allows us to safely be able to vectorize um, any loop that causes page problems and stuff like that. Another advantage, though, of this approach that, that we've first chosen, in which if once you finish your vector iteration or you're going into an early exit, you branch to the scalar code, it does have the advantage that it can vectorize loops where in the if condition, you have, for instance, clobber memory. So, for instance, if you do a printf or whatever, because that part of the code won't, won't be vectorized anyway. So that's why we'll keep both, um, both methods around and make it a costing issue. Uh, as well, we're working on supporting, um, supporting early breaks in SLP, um, and there'll be uh, more information about that in Vectorize above. Now, one of the big use cases for doing this, aside from the obvious, is that um, there are loops like std-find and std-find ifs in a lot of programs, and today we've just failed to vectorize them. And one of the, well, there are two reasons for this. One, we couldn't vectorize early breaks, now we can, but we couldn't vectorize loops with unknown bounds. Soon we will be able to. However, the way the code was unrolled in libsdc++ meant that it was pretty much impossible to vectorize. So this year, Jonathan was kind enough to remove the, the unrolled loop. And so now we should be able to soon vectorize all these cases. And we've seen some pretty good improvements across a whole range of software. In so, uh, GCC 14, we also had to finally introduce a new pair of fusion paths. A very simple thing, it just basically tries to find pairs of adjacent memories accesses and merge them into an LDP or an SDP pair. Very simple optimization, however, um, we were relying on, on Shed Fusion plus some peoples. The Shed Fusion wasn't very good at moving instruction across, across long, um, longer chains. It also, we also had the issue that shed one would actually move, for instance, if you have a post increment, it would move the add in between the two loads, causing us to have a register allocation issue where it now where it will reload, now has to save the old value before it does the second load and then move it. So it was breaking codes like our um, math routines in GLFC, or you couldn't really write, really write very well optimized crypto code in GDC. So in the end, we decided to well, we really need a pass for this. Luckily, with RTL, as I say, it was easy enough to do. I think it's usually 15, the uh, PowerPC guys lifted it from ARCIS for a specific pass into a gen generic pass, so any target can make use of it now. I do think we have further work that we might want to extend it. Currently, it's only looking at a single basic block, but we might want to look at extended basic blocks instead of move loads and storage across it. And then we also added SME and SME2 support in GC14. Um, it's a bit of a how to, how to use it on the right side with some intrinsic code, the details of which are quite expensive, so go look at the, the GC14 blog. But we also added some limited auto vectorizer support for streaming mode. Can I ask the power of the is that, uh, do you see any big benefit from bad loads other than the one, one fewer instruction, of course? Yes, we do. So there are, one of the big reasons for doing this well is um, mem copy and, uh, and, uh, and all, all these memory routines, which require you to have, a, uh, uh, to use the highest, well, how do I say, the sequences oh, okay. with the highest number of throughputs in order right. to get the maximum performance. And if you break it up somewhere, then, you get, then you'll break the core streaming right. mode, for instance. So with the paired load, you get uh, closer to your actual memory bandwidth of the hardware, right? Yeah. Uh, and also, we, we've had issues where, for instance, the, the loop is designed specifically to fit inside your fetch block. And this yeah. one extra instruction makes you keep missing it. Right. So, so well, I was going to ask that, I guess. 
uh, you see that on actual generated code as yeah. well. Okay. Well. In fact, every single GC release, there's an innocent change that happens that causes you to generate a slightly different code that, that, that screws it up. So that's, why, that's yeah. why one of the reasons why we couldn't keep patching Chef Fusion. It just wasn't going to work. Thanks. So on Power, we tried to do this, and I know Ajit has been kind of working with you trying to make a, a shared um, infrastructure for Power and, and ARM on here. For, for you guys, I guess I'm not sure, do you actually have a larger sized vector load? Or are you just trying to keep the two adjacent loads or stores adjacent to each other in the code stream so they, they execute faster? I, cause well, one of the things that this can do is it can actually pull them together when they've been separated by more uh, code. Right. So in but, but for you guys, you, you actually... Um, not, uh, not stores. Okay. Because, or at least on power, on power 10, we have our, our vector loads and stores, but we also, with Power 10, added a, a single paired load uh, that loads two vectors with one instruction. So for us, the, the, the whole sketch fusion is important because then we can re replace two loads with one load that would do the same amount. It, well, but, but that's not what you guys do? Yeah, so, so okay. we do have, for instance, in Neon, we do, okay. so this is the, we do have the vector version of load store and, lo and load pair. We do have multiple loads and stores factor instructions, like think two or three registers. Usually they are permuted, but in the case where, for instance, you're copying a large region of memory, it doesn't really matter the order you're copying and pasting it from, it's just copying the entire region. So in those cases, for instance, you could do a larger LD3, for instance, and an SC3, and it may work out depending on the microarchitecture and stuff like that. So did I hear you right here that you, you guys still are dependent on fusion? Did I hear you right that you're still dependent on the, the old style fusion macros or are you working with them to move to this framework? So we initially posted a target only pass that would go through and do this. Um, and I think we did this before you guys even put the your part out there. Because I think we posted ours, you guys ended up having yours, which I think was also target specific, but then yep. we saw a lot of commonality there, and that's when we said, hey, let's kind of like, let's do this together. And I think Ajit was working with you guys then to kind of pull the, the commonality parts out into our architecture independent part, and then, uh, uh, and then we, each target would have their own, their own good, little good. specific the part. Is, uh, a few years ago, I looked Um, a few years back, I looked at using the um, sketch reordering hooks to go find these things. And that actually proved quite profitable. That was much better than any of the other approaches I'd seen. Um, but it sounds like you're moving towards this more generic approach now. So go for it. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I, would, I would avoid the old fusion for that, the, the old style, because it just not, it does not find a lot or as many opportunities as it can. So for instance, one, one of the things that this does is as well, so the pass runs in, in two places, once before redis allocation, once after redis allocation, and we had to do this because forming fusions of your, for instance, of your of stack addresses early had sometimes created in, inefficient code generation. So we ignore any stack address before um, redis allocator and then do them after. Because also reload can introduce pillows and stuff like that, so we need to get them anyway. I mean, I think the other thing is all these new passes, they send, tend to start out fairly architecture specific and they become more generic as we support more targets. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Mark's got questions. So you did say LD3 and LD4. Is that right? Did I hear, did I hear you say the... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I heard, I heard you say LD3 and LD4. So can it detect the swizzling patterns or is it just looking for a sequence of three loads and you just use an LD3 as a proxy? Yeah, so at, at the moment we only look at two sequential loads, but the tracking mechanism being used can, can, can track more than, more than two loads. I'm not sure today whether it can, for instance, track permutes and undo them, for instance. On right, because the LD3 is more of a permute and that's why yeah. I was, I mean, LD2, LDP, 
I mean, go for the LDP. You don't need to worry about the permute. Exactly. So if you're just moving memory, the permute doesn't matter. So then it's just sequential errors memory. Um, to get it to work, we did have to rework how memory accesses are defined in ER64. Okay. Uh, so now it should be a bit more straightforward. But we haven't really started looking at this yet, at the, the LD2, LD3 version. But if you do go for the LD3, LD4, do you also plan to have some kind of cost models to decide whether it's profitable or not? Or is it yeah, is so, it going to be profitable everywhere? No, it's not going to be profitable anywhere. So, for instance, on Lilo course, it's going to be very bad. Okay, thanks. Right, just to continue on SME, because you started talking about SME, I thought I'd bring up this little gem here. So, um, historical reasons when SME was implemented, it required... Uh, SV2 to be implemented. The uh, ISA architects did a bit of a U-turn on us and defined SME to not require SV2. So GC currently enables SV2 when you pass plus SME, but it shouldn't. And we've been told that some people, there are people worried that if you start using GC to build a library and then switch to LVM or vice versa, that um, lack of compatibility there might cause some issues. So we are going to, from GC15, we will make sure that ARMv8A plus SME does not enable SV by default. Um, the initial idea is also to just get the compiler to error out and say, sorry, we don't support SME without SV2. Not so much because of instruction selection, because I think, well, Richard Sandiford told me that that should be okay, but he also told me that throughout the compiler and out of actualization, all that sort of thing, there are certain built-in expectations or assumptions that SV2 is there if SME2 is, or if SME is there. Um, so those would need to be resolved until we can claim, oh, this is absolutely fully supported. Uh, we might support it in the future, but, uh, don't but know yet. all such expectations are very artificial, right? They're just la lazy coder syndrome, basically. Those are, sorry, what? All, all expectations that SMP implies SV2 are... Uh, I mean, it, it was because... It was defined that way in the architecture, so it wasn't a lazy Oh, it was defined in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Which LVM has been struggling with, and yeah, we'll um, we'll look at that once if if we need it. So now, for instance, if you do ARMv9 A, ARMv9 A by default supports or enables SV2, so you don't get that problem. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see in the future. I don't. There's not much to dwell on this here. I think. Oh, yeah. Don't ask me. Do not. I, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even okay. Fair it's enough. The, the, I, I think it's also a good idea to have to you know adhere to the to the architecture specifications. Architecture specification it is possible. So I don't know. Uh, I think the next one is you, Richard. Okay, this is this is the only arm slide that I've got. Um, just a couple of th sorry. <laughs> Your whole slide is deprecation. <laughs> a lot of it, yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of it is actually about tidying up some of the crud that we've got lying around from, ooh, 20, 30 years. Yes. How long have I been working on this port? Um, yes, so the first two things is this year I got rid of FPA and Maverick from the assembler. Um, they were removed from GCC 10 years ago. It really didn't seem like it was worth keeping that stuff. Um, the next one that I think is on my hit list is the old ARM ELF com configuration. Uh, that was the old ABI, which became obsolete 10 years ago. It certainly was deprecated 10 years ago when the EABI came out. Um, there's a lot of code in the assembler now, which is still trying to pander to it. And I'd like to get rid of it, but I'm trailing this as something of an intention at this point, rather than actually going and doing it. Um, Depending on the feedback, I may just go and do it. But um. It will be a lot easier if you have already removed it from GCC to do it from... In uh, GCC in hasn't generated the old ABI for a while now. I think NetBSD, the original NetBSD port was the only one that really right. still had it, and that's gone. It went into something that was a little bit of a halfway house, but I think even that... Um, 
NetBSD, like all BSDs, has moved mostly over to LLVM. So, and I don't so, think they care now because those so, are all the ABI ports. Yeah. Uh, uh, if if people care, then they want to use an older compiler with a new, much newer beam. That's just, my opinion as well. It, well, it's an older assembler as well. Yeah. But, uh, sorry, Nick. <laughs> Just want to say, for the record, I, I'm all in favour of this. So go ahead. Yeah. Get rid of I think the I think the person it will upset most is Alan because he t he still builds that in his auto builder. Yes, but, but um, he, I don't think he's going to care he'll, that much. He'll, it'll be all right. Yeah. Um, similarly, do we still need cough support? That one might be a bit more. So big cough includes Windows CE and the PE cough variant. Um, that one might be a bit more controversial because. I don't know if anybody writes BIOSes for AOPS32 now, but they sort of rely on that feature. Um, but the real problem is that the COF support has never really been adapted for the, AB, for the EABI, and therefore it doesn't support mProfile and all the modern cores. Um, it can't record any information about a new CPU because they were using header bits, and they were out of header bits 15 years ago. <laughs> So it's just stagnated since then. If it is going to stay, it needs a maintainer because ARM can't really commit to it. If the cost of what is going in general is it has to look on the machine gets set, I think most people are using GT1, which has a better one. We'll take that offline, but um, essentially there's a lot of stuff in there that is clearly broken. And if we're going to support it, we need to do things like support mapping symbols and dot inst and um, probably even build attributes so that the port can actually record the information that's needed. But that needs somebody to step forward and decide that it's worth it, their effort. Um, GCC, let's get rid of Symbian Elf. Symbian died 10 years ago. Um, sorry. <laughs> I worked on that port. <laughs> I've only seen bug reports about it that you know, complain that this and that doesn't work and uh, nobody's interested in fixing them. So if we're not going to fix them, we should just admit defeat and get rid of it. Um, go and use the older cores. Um, this has been trailed several times, and I think I've had agreement from most people getting rid of the Xscale extensions. It's not rid getting rid of Xscale itself, because that's just an v 5 core, but the extensions are only specific to that series of cores, and the Xscale is history now. Um, I'd like to do that. Uh, I wouldn't remove it from bin utils. This is just dropping the GCC support at this point. Um, there are a bunch of other ports that seem to have been inactive. Phoenix, anyone know what that is? It seems to have been an RTOS, if I remember rightly, but it, it, it's certainly been, looking at their website, it's been moribund since COVID, as far as I can tell. Um, and are there any other ports that we can clean up and get, you know, just just get rid of? Because they're all things that are, there's bits of code in there that nobody understands. And that's just a pain. All for removing old ports. If people still want it, you could always do what we did on power, like with the SPE stuff, and we forked. We uh, fork to the port well, uh, because yeah, no, one I mean, there's, on, there's no, always, no one on that end is working on testing. Use. So we just split it, put all the SPE stuff over there, removed it from us, and then it was up to them to keep their specialized part of. Of course, they didn't, and then it ended uh, up in these cases. Splitting. This is but yes, yeah, yep, yeah. Uh, in this case, this is my, main, mainly just minor RTOS support code. Um, so it's more about the libraries and the configuration. It's not not the compiler su support specifically, but it, it's just more cruft that's in the code that is getting in the way of doing developing and making sure that we haven't broken them each time we do an update. I think that's the lot for the slides. No, no, I have one more. Do you? Oh, you've, you've inserted one after mine. That was cheeky. <laughs> Go on. Oh, is there another question? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a point that, uh, uh, well, just not, uh, just see if they notice you, <laughs> you the new details. <laughs> Oh, there's a more subtle way of doing it. You just make sure that it doesn't actually work. 
And yeah. if you don't get any bug reports, then clearly it's not working. But... Right. We're we'll removing everything that's not LRA. <laughs> Most of those are going to go away. I noticed there's some SH activity of late. <laughs> yeah. Docker. We discussed that at Montreal. Yeah, that was Montreal. <laughs> I, I think we're. I, I don't see anything in that list that is critical. Now, that oh, I'm sure it's not. That, yeah. yeah. There are people that care about the HPPA. There are people that yeah. care about the Golden Rule of 68,000. There are people that care about blah, blah, blah. But are they those critical? And if they're critical, those who own them need to step up. Exactly, yes. And, and it's the same here to some extent. These, these ports need to have an owner. I am technically the maintainer of 68,000. They should use an old trial. Docker. So, speaking. Uh, of 10 year old stuff, um, there are still notes emitted for ABI changes which happened in uh, GCC 5. And you only have the option to turn off these notes uh, all uh, or, or, or keep them forever. You have, you have, to, you can turn them off all, even the ones which appeared in GCC 13, or you have to keep them all. So is there can't, any... can't you set a version number as a baseline? That might no. make more sense. Uh, so... Patch is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Andrew Pinsky just closed that bug twice again. So. Um... From my point of view, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andre. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, so in, in our day to day, we often get questions from people within ARM or customers or sometimes products managers and things like that asking, oh, how do I use this feature on, on, on Linux? On what, what, what option do I use? And we say, oh, this is the option. So, oh, okay, this doesn't work. What GC do we need? We need the latest or two year old GC. And they go, oh, we're still using GC 8, 9, 10. How do we upgrade? And it's often difficult to tell them, oh, use this tool chain, especially if they are using non enterprise distros. You know, think like Ubuntu, uh, CentOS are quite often the ones we hear about. And, um, Short of telling them, okay, just download the GC sources and be new those sources and build yourself a new tool chain. It's very difficult to get them a newer tool chain to make sure that they can use all this, all these features that we've been working really hard on. Um, so, and I have to admit, this was my idea. I think Tamar brought me to this idea. Is like, why why don't we have things like Debian packages for um, combinations of newer or not but newer GC and be neutrals using older or built for older GLBC so that they can be used in these older distros so that they don't need to switch to a very latest Ubuntu to use GC14, for instance. Um, this is something that we're thinking about doing uh, internally, obviously making the Debian packages public so people can download them. But I just thought I'd mention that here because I don't know what, how other um, targets deal with this or other people. Can you technically put GCC on FlatHub or some kind of these containers? So like, would GCC even work when it's in a container? It'll work. So why not yeah, do that and, and like put a link on, put it in, in, the, in the two big, I think, snap for, for all the Ubuntu people yeah. and the other one for the, the RPM folks? It's you know, using containers would certainly be easier than what Red Hat did with the developer tool set, which tackled that problem, but did not include glibc for um, good reasons. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the IBM guys have been down this with the uh, advanced tool chain, and glibc creates um, difficulties. <laughs> um, I really think containerization is the path forward here, and it does work. I mean, I've, I've used 
these bits in containers. They do work. Um, and if you try to do this, you're opening yourself up for a lot of maintenance work in the long term. So um, the GDFC part can be solved by targeting the tool chain to an older version that is your common baseline. So that is fairly easy to do. The problem you're going to run into is Lips and C++ and dependency on new um, symbols that aren't in the distribution Lips and C++. Yeah. And that's why GC2 said there's some magic stuff with hybrid linkage model. Um, but that is uh, as a high maintenance cost, okay. so that could be, yeah, we could maybe steal it because the patches are public, but uh, it is uh, complicated. And there are other libraries, of course, in GCC that may need a similar uh, a treatment, but it is, it's not currently covered by GCC toolset. I think the toolset, the, the biggest problem, the biggest problem the toolset has been lib or C++ through the years and trying to get that separation of what's in the base versus what has to go hybrid link and use the stack. Yeah, Jakub uh, spends some quality time to work up that magic patch for every release that we do. And of course, it's different for every Lips and C++ base we're using. So, right, so you'd almost have to, like, so if you build GC14, you have to tell, okay, but build Lips and C++ for whatever GCC version that hosts. Is yeah, using. you need to have a differential between what your target is using and what the upstream sources expect. Yeah to be present and you yeah. have to fill that gap somehow, either by upgrading the system that's on C++, by linking everything statically, which doesn't always work, yeah. or by doing that hybrid linkage dance, which requires yeah, some symbol management. Our path was considered remote. <laughs> I was so, part of the team that worked through that. So no, all that not. <laughs> well, we do today create internally fully packaged GCC tool chains for Linux, and that's what our internal customers are using. So we do, we do. I don't, I don't know how it works, but today we do have standalone packages that that where you compile it compiles and runs against the new Linux C++. I've been told that the main consumers of that are like Yocto people, and I don't understand how yeah. it works, but they make it work somehow. So, um, my question would be, what's, what's the purpose of having such a uh, tool chain, such a backport? It, it, because it's, it, it's not a problem um, having them, but it's a problem when people start using them. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, no, but um, it, um, I mean, I used to have some, some backports in PPAs, and, and then you had somebody building software, other packages with these backports and suddenly uh, oh, it doesn't run, uh, so the third party software doesn't run anymore on that distro, on that release. Because you have a newer libsc++ mostly and, and, uh, and things like that happen. So, yeah, so I'm a, a bit skeptical. So the goal isn't though to replace the system GCC. The goal isn't to replace the system GCC. Well, yes, but, so, No, no. So, so actually, for for uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise, you get the even SUSE Linux Enterprise 12, which is now going, I think, tomorrow or in a few days, out of general support. You have the libstandard C++ from GCC 13, and as a required update for if you are a supported customer, and we have no problems with that, with updating the standard the C++ standard library and shipping your libg Fortran. And the libgcc is no problem anyway. So uh, the problems with that are basically non-existent. Uh, only basically. Libgcc, NT, libc, and that kind of thing uh, just work for backward and forward compatibility. Yes. Only backwards, yeah, not forwards. Okay, so so the, the the history of power with our advanced tool chain, not advanced. As in, it's a lot of stuff. It's just advanced as in it's early. Uh, when we started this was because we didn't have Red Hat and the SUSEs and that didn't have these developer toolkits. And we had users that wanted this today and now. And we do build glibc. We also build other libraries. The, 
the really hard part on all that uh, was trying to get the advanced tool chain to gracefully fall back to the system libraries that we didn't want to have to ship. We didn't want to ship a distro, you know, yeah. for the whole tool chain. Yeah. <laughs> but we wanted, we, but we needed glibc and we needed GCC and we had some other ones that's on there. And it was having a separate LD config and, and running that. And actually, I've, I've realized, I think there was a recent change to LD config now because we have our own LD, ld.conf and all that. And I believe in one of the latest versions, when we'd run ours, it would just update our LD config. But now there's some change where it actually, we noticed it not only changed our special LD cache file, it also changed the system one. So we've had to then patch out that part of the LD config part. I, it was kind of scary. And so I think it comes back to the containers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're out, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, if you've got anything else to add, please come and find us. <laughs> Great job.